Yeah, so I uh, hope everyone had a good time at the, uh, the party last night. Uh, I know I did. I, I cut it short a little bit early so I could go record a podcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, my name is Matt Ray. I'm the regional manager and customer architect for Chef for, for APJ. And what that means is, is you know, I go around um, the region helping, helping our partners, helping our community, uh, helping our customers, uh, you know, use Chef. And, and I've been there for quite a while. Um, coming up on eight years, which in startup time is forever. Uh, but uh, I've been in, involved in the DevOps community for, for quite a while, and uh, I'm not like DevOps royalty. I know, you know, last year we had uh, Andrew Clay Shaver, you had, you had Ken yesterday. <laughs> um, but uh, I've, I've hung around with a lot of those folks and been uh, kind of on the scene for a while, so I, I, I have some, some stories I can tell, and, and I'll share a few of those. Um, and I was uh, one of the organizers for DevOps Days Austin for a, a while before I moved, uh, before I moved out here. Um, and, and like uh, Sergio said, uh, I do have a, a podcast that I do with uh, Michael Cote uh, and uh, Brandon Wichard called Software Defined Talk. So, uh, you know, it, it's not exactly a DevOps thing. We, we just kind of talk about tech and stuff. So, uh, so that's me. Uh, hello, everyone. So let's get started. Let's talk about uh, kind of the history of DevOps. Um, you know, the first DevOps days was in Ghent in December of 2009. And it was a, a pretty small event. Uh, it was organized by, by Patrick Dubois, who's kind of, you know, the, the godfather of DevOps, if, if, you've, uh, if you've heard of, of him. Uh, there were about 50 people there. Um, only, you know, a lot of people will say they were there. I wasn't there, right? <laughs> uh, a lot of people say they were there, but, you know, they actually had put the attendee list online. So, you know, there, there weren't that many people uh, there. Um, but... Uh, John Willis was there, uh, and, uh, Patrick Dubois was there, and, and Andrew Clay Schaefer were there. And um, it was the first time that they, they got a group together to talk about um, uh, DevOps. And, and before DevOps, of course, we had Agile, right? Agile at this time was about 10 years old. You know, the Agile Manifesto came out, uh, I think, in 99, somewhere around there, 2000, whatever. Um, and, you know, the developer community, they, they were all on board with Agile and, and you know, moving fast and Scrum and getting away from waterfall. But in operations, you know, the state of the art was ITIL, right? Um, and it was a very waterfall approach that was very risk averse. Uh, you didn't want to break things. You didn't want to move fast because you might accidentally uh, uh, break things. But um, you know, open source was already quite popular. Uh, I was actually working for an open source monitoring company at the time. Um, you know, uh, I think CF Engine showed up in 1993. You know, so they, they were doing open source long before a lot of folks. Puppet was early 2000s. Chef was uh, just had their 10th birthday. So you know, it's it, it's not like the tooling wasn't already on the scene. You know, and obviously Nagios has been around forever. Um, but in 2004, Amazon introduced AWS, Amazon Web Services, right? They had S3 and EC2. And people were kind of like, oh, what's that? But, but before that happened, there wasn't really the concept of shadow IT, right? It just didn't exist. You know, IT was those guys because they had the budget and they bought the stuff and they controlled access to it. Um, but cloud kind of changed the way things could work. You, know, you, you had the ability to, to move fast. You had the ability to go around your roadblocks if, uh, if they were part of your organization. Um, and, and this kind of gave rise to the idea of, of the concept of agile infrastructure. So uh, Andrew, Andrew, Schaefer, Andrew Clay Schaefer and Patrick Dubois gave a talk at the Agile 2008 conference in Toronto uh, entitled Agile Infrastructure. They, nobody said DevOps yet. Um, and it wasn't particularly well received. Uh, you know, there. You know, from what I've heard, not a lot of people showed up, <laughs> but it, it it did catch the mind of like the right uh, Usenet mailing list and, and and that sort of stuff and IRC and and you know people were were kind of uh, catching on to that uh, idea. I mean, the the Velocity Conference actually started in 2007, and I don't know if you remember, but it, the first year was actually mostly JavaScript frameworks, right? <laughs> How to make big uh, web apps move faster, but it quickly took on the, the side of web operations and, and moving fast. And so uh, in 2009, I was at uh, Velocity when uh, John Allspaw and, and Paul Hammond gave their talk um, about 10 deploys per day, you know, DevOps and cooperation at Flickr. And there were literally people like, 
you know, mumbling under their breath that these guys were crazy during the talk. They were like, oh no, you can't attend. You know, you'll break things. 10 deploys a day, that's craziness. I mean, and when they finished their talk, there was just this mob of people who came up the front who, some of them were like, tell me more, and some of them wanted to argue, right? This was like, actually, you know, people were like, you know, 10 deploys a day was crazy talk. And, and you know, obviously today you're like, oh yeah, 10 deploys a day, that's, that's pretty good. You know, some people are, you know, 100 deploys a day, you got microservices, things are going crazy. But this was, you know, this was VMs and cloud instances and, you know, it was kind of an exciting time. And, uh, yeah, so that was, you know, we still didn't really have a lot of, of DevOps movement, but those are kind of the spikes in the ground for, you know, setting the, setting the stage for, for what came next. And, and so what came next was uh, at Velocity 2010, the next year, um, O'Reilly released a book called Web Operations. And, and for, for a lot of, uh, for, for many years when people asked me if there was a good DevOps book, this is the one I would recommend. And, and so Web Operations was uh, edited by John Alsbach from Flickr, right? And, and Jesse Robbins, who had been uh, one of the founders of the Velocity Conference, director of operations for uh, Amazon, and uh, one of the founders of Chef. And so they were the, the editors, and, and the book is essentially a collection of essays about how to do different things. And if you, if you pick it up today, it's still completely relevant, right? They, there's not a lot of, you know, oh, you're going to use, you know, Puppet or Chef or CF Engine. It's very uh, high-level abstract, right? You know, so there's, there's a chapter on infrastructure as code uh, by Adam Jacob. There's a monitoring section by Patrick Dubois. They don't tie too much to the tools as much as the ideas. And those ideas are all really still relevant today. And so what was amazing about the book was, they released it you know, uh, at the same time at Velocity, right? So you know, everyone you know, registered for Velocity, went over, and O'Reilly had a booth where you could you know, get your free book. And that night I went to my room and I read it like cover to cover, right? <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd been through a whole day of these talks, the same people on stage giving the talks, and then I went and read the book, and everyone else did too, right? I mean, it was just like this book was the first time everything had been put together in, in kind of one place. And then after three days of velocity of hearing you know, amazing talks from you know, all those people giving those talks, DevOps Days Mountain View. It was the first one in the US. Um, and so we went from three days of velocity to, to you know, two more days of talking about DevOps. And um, <clears throat> it was the same conversations you'd had, and it just continued on. And so that was, that was kind of the first really big DevOps Days. There were about 300 people there. And it was, I don't even remember the, the venue, but it was you know, not a, a nice venue or anything. It was like the back of a warehouse. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it really took off because, you know, here we are today. Uh, they've got, you know, 200 DevOps days worldwide. Um, so something worked. <laughs> so um, around the time of Velocity, uh, a little bit after it, um, you know, DevOps had kind of started to take off as a term. DevOps doesn't appear in the web operations book. It just doesn't have that, you know, that, that phrase. Uh, but, you know, DevOps days, uh, kind of started, uh, you know, started catching uh, the idea in, in people's minds. And so uh, John Willis, who uh, you've probably uh, seen him uh, around, um, he wrote a, uh, a blog post uh, for Chef uh, called What DevOps Means to Me, where he put a stake in the ground and he said, look, DevOps, it's not tools, right? It's not, um, you know, if you use, uh, you know, if you use Chef, you're doing DevOps. It, it, he said it's not a tools thing. There are, are four things to it. Um, you know, as, as Ken said yesterday, it's culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. And kind of, you know, you can't do one without the others, or else you're, you know, you're just doing part, part of it. And this is how you're going to succeed with this. So the culture part is, you know, people over processes. You know, getting to know the people you work with, having a empathy for your, your coworkers. As you can work, safely work together, it's about removing the barriers between developers and operations. Automation. Obviously important, right? If you want to move fast, you want to take the manual steps out uh, and you know, get to, you know, be able to uh, do release management, provisioning, configuration management, integration, monitoring, all that needs to be automated, right? You, there's, you know, putting, putting manual steps in there is, is not really well. And of course, measurement means seeing the results of what you do, right? If you can't measure something, you can't do better. You know, you can't, uh, you can't improve. So it's, you know, metrics for performance, metrics for monitoring, it's all very important. And then sharing. You know, that's what we're doing today. We're talking with each other. We're, we're letting people know, like, hey, I saw that before. Let me tell you how I fixed it, right? And the way DevOps is done at, you know, Standard Chartered versus how DevOps is done at, at, at GovTech or something, they're very different, right? But 
they're both trying to do DevOps. They're both trying to improve and learn and share their, the, the, their lessons uh, with each other. And that's, that's why it's really uh, key. And, and you know, later on, the L got added uh, for, for Lean, because it's a lot of the same processes, a, a little more prescriptive about some of the, the steps. But, um, but this, is, you know, this is still very relevant, obviously. And, and, and DevOps isn't meant to be a runaround you know, IT. It's not meant to be like, hey, how can we make shadow IT go faster? Um, it's, it's not a product. You know, I think a couple people said you can't, you can't really be a DevOps engineer. Um, but it's, it's more the practices and the principles of how we, de how we deliver business outcomes through IT. Right? That's what it's all about. You know, your job as an IT operations person is not to run servers. Right? No, no C CEO ever said, like, great uptime. Right. <laughs> uh, the, the goal really is to move the business faster. And so that's what DevOps means. Uh, so August 2010, right after this, uh, the continuous delivery book came out. And, and this was not aimed at operations. You know, this was actually aim, aimed at developers, um, primarily. And, and, and so this, uh, this was written by Jez Humble uh, and David Farley uh, about their experiences doing continuous delivery of, of both software uh, and uh, infrastructure, but you know, they finally codified a lot of the patterns about how you should release software. And the ideas of, of you know, uh, small changes quickly, that was actually kind of revolutionary. I mean, you, know, you kind of got that impression when you were working with tools like uh, Hudson, you know, before, before Jenkins, and, and uh, you know, Cruise Control and the likes. But uh, it was nice to have somebody write it down, that you know, fast feedback loops happen when you make small changes and you get that, that, that feedback so you can cor uh, correct course even faster. Um, and so you know, this, this book is you know, still very relevant. Uh, the patterns still hold today. Um, and and it, it, that, that fast feedback loop is you know, how we learned why Agile beats Waterfall, right? Being able to do course corrections quickly uh, is important. And at the end of the day, a lot of what DevOps is, is supply chain of your IT to, to deliver business. And so if you can make that supply chain more efficient, that's what it's all about. Uh, a few months later, uh, there was a really uh, inflammatory uh, article that uh, was posted on the, the Forrester blog uh, by uh, Mike uh, Galateri, um, where he said, I don't want DevOps. I want no ops. And you know, the DevOps, uh, you know, uh, inf influential folks were like, oh, this is crazy talk, right? You know, you're never going to get rid of operations. Because he was essentially saying, like, well, we've got cloud, we've got SaaS, we don't need operations anymore, right? And, and you know, we're still here, right? <laughs> and, and the fact of the matter is, you know, even as things like serverless come on the scene, someone's going to have to understand how these things tie together, right? You're never going to get rid of the glue. And that's really what it, you know, things come down to, is you can say, like, I don't want IT, I don't want you know, uh, operations, but at the end of the day, someone has to make things work. And that's, you know, so, so no ops is pretty much a, a pipe dream. Um, but it, it started a good conversation. And, and what, was, what was really important was um, he pointed out that developers need to be focused on the business needs, right? Operations needs to be solving business problems. And it just it comes back to that again and again. Um, he wasn't the first person to make this argument. Uh, I think Nicholas Carr had a had a, a book or an article um, about the end of IT. You know, so it was it was you know uh, still uh, still a good conversation, but uh, we're still just trying to make software go faster. So as we started thinking about software moving faster and continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, there was a, a book that came out in June of 2011 uh, called "Test Driven Infrastructure with Chef," and you know, this, you know, the book is totally out of date. Um, the technology's in it, nobody's used for, you know, well, six years, seven years. Um, but nobody had really talked about test-driven infrastructure until this book came out, right? We, we talked a little bit about infrastructure as code. I mean, you know, CF Engine, Puppet, Chef, they were, they were out. People were used to the idea of everything in your infrastructure is going to be modeled in, in, in code, but nobody had really thought about code, you know, infrastructure code the same way developers do, right? Developers, they make a commit, it goes through a battery of automated tests, you got your unit tests, your linting, your syntax checking. That, that was a new idea. And, and so this book uh, was kind of the first to, to, to say like, hey, you are building a CI/CD pipeline around your infrastructure. 
and it needs to be well tested. And there are things that you can test just like software developers test their, their Java applications that you can do with your infrastructure. Um, and so you know, that, that was uh, actually you know, uh, a very popular talk that year at Velocity, you know, where, hey, let's talk about infrastructure as code and testing our code. And you know, this is still something that, uh, you know, obviously, you know, coming from Chef, we're really big on testing um, to the point where you know, other ecosystems use our tooling. <laughs> but, uh, but this comes back to things like mean time to recovery, right? And having a healthy pipeline, being able to stress test your infrastructure, being able to recreate it uh, on demand, that's all part of it. You know, so yesterday we had the, 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 the talk about chaos, uh, chaos engineering, right? This is, this, you know, that's the evolution of, of the lessons learned from this, is being able to inject faults into your CICD. Nobody was testing CICD before, right? So this is a, you know, kind of a, a seminal book. Um, who's read the Phoenix Project, right? Uh, I was surprised to find that this book is only five years old, right? It seems like it's been out forever, and, and uh, they've sold almost half a million copies. So it's uh, obviously the best-selling DevOps kind of book that's out there. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's, it's, a, it's a book of fiction, or a book of fiction. It's a novel, uh, the, kind of the fictionalization of uh, an IT story, right? Where you've got uh, Bill, who's this uh, I, everyman IT manager who's uh, working for Parts Unlimited, and they've got a big IT initiative uh, that they've called the Phoenix Project, probably because it keeps burning down, but you know, someday it's going to rise from the ashes. And you know, as you go through the story, he, there are characters that you kind of recognize. You, you got your, your Brent, who's the guy who, he's, everyone goes to him because he can solve every problem. So he kind of becomes this you know, bottleneck of, of IT where everybody comes to Brent because he's the guy who solves it and Brent never really shares information with other people and you know, Brent wants to go on vacation or quit or get hit by a bus. Yeah. So you know, it, it's, it's a very good story. Uh, if, if, if you have you know, someone who you're trying to get these ideas across and they're not particularly already in this ecosystem, hand them the book. Hand them the book. The audiobook's pretty good too. Um, but it, it, it touches on a lot of these concepts in a, in a nice, uh, uh, you know, accessible way. Ideas like continuous delivery, uh, you know, short feedback loops, continuous improvement. Um, that's all built in there. It's, it's based off of a, a, a manufacturing book uh, called The Goal, which was an earlier novelization of you know, this uh, business processes. But you know, this is still a really good book. And uh, you know, still, uh, they, they've got a, a revised version, apparently. <laughs> uh, so a little bit after this, um, there, O'Reilly started to kind of hop on, uh, hop on the, the e-book uh, idea, right? Um, I mean, I, I downloaded an e-book this morning, right? They, they're, they're really popular if you want to get like 10 to 30 pages on a topic, right? And so O'Reilly uh, put out a bunch of them at the time. They put out uh, Building a DevOps Culture uh, by Mandy Walls. They put out DevOps for Finance, DevOps Hiring, DevOps in Practice. And uh, they put out uh, Dave Zwieback's The Human Side of Postmortems, right? Um, and the idea here is, is one of the things we learned from ITIL was you know, we need to manage risk uh, and, and that failure is bad. And failure always has a root cause. That's one of the things we learned from ITIL. And uh, probably if uh, John Elspaugh was here, he'd throw something at me. But the idea is there's actually not a root cause. If somebody says, the reason this IT system went down was because you know, Ken w went, w turned off his pager and wasn't there to fix it. That's not Ken's fault, right? Um, you know, the, the, the whole idea behind postmortems is you need to get to the five whys of, of, of what happened. You know, well, why, you know, sorry Ken, I'm gonna keep picking on you because you're right here. <laughs> you know, well, why was it Ken's fault that this thing went down? You know, who made him the single source of, of, of operations, right? Why didn't we have something like PagerDuty doing you know, a rotation of the, the, the paging schedules? Or you know, when he needed to be out of pocket, he couldn't send it off to somebody else. Why did we have a single point of failure? Why wasn't there a backup uh, goalkeeper on this thing? Um, so you know, the idea really is there's not usually a root cause. There's an environment that has allowed this failure to happen, what can we do to correct those things in, in the environment? And this comes back to being a learning organization. We learn from failure. Failure is an opportunity to do better, right? It's, a, it's an opportunity to learn and, and you know, make a more resilient system. So next time, well, we, we'll put some sort of paging uh, you know, uh, rotation in, in place. Or, hey, 
maybe we weren't monitoring the right things, or you know, uh, maybe there's a bug in the software. You know, so we can make our CI/CD pipelines catch these things next time, so they don't get into production. There's a lot of opportunities to learn, and so the idea behind postmortems is let's move it off of blaming a person or you know even blaming the software uh, to you know let's make the system more resilient so it doesn't happen again. And so you know this is obviously still really relevant, but uh, you know we want to avoid things like burnout and, and hero syndrome, where one person is you know, the one who saves the day for everything, and eventually they are going to quit. <laughs> right. So, who remembers when Docker came out, right? It was uh, exciting times. Um, I, was, I was at OSCON uh, when, when Docker was launched by DocCloud. Um, Solomon Hikes gave a talk uh, that was not, I mean, I think they had open sourced it about two weeks before OSCON. And it had you know, picked up some buzz pretty, pretty well. It was a well-attended session. Afterwards, I, I came and talked to him about it, invited him to come to ChefConf, and he came and presented to Chef uh, Engineering, and everyone was like, this is awesome. It's better than LXC, right? It's lightweight virtualization. We all missed the boat, right? Everyone didn't really get that Docker was this amazing packaging format that allowed you to put whatever you want in this box, put it somewhere else, and it just works, right? We, we just thought about it as like, you know, better than VMware, right? <laughs> um, but you know, it, 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 it took a while for everyone to kind of grasp what had happened here. You know, that, that there'd been a, a sea change in how we think about delivering IT. You know, we, had a, a, we finally had the, the promise of you know, write once, run everywhere in this really great packaging form, format. Uh, and James Turnbull wrote, uh, which is a really good book that he still continues to update. So, so James has a lot of books. I'll, I'll talk about a couple more. But you know, he's got Puppet, Nagios, Logstash, Terraform, Prometheus, you know, lo lots of books. Um, and he keeps them up to date. So you know, buy, buy his ebooks and, and you know, get on that uh, free uh, free upgrades path. Um, but this this you know, Docker really changed things to the point where people are like, you know what? Now that we have Docker, we don't need IT. You know, just like the whole no ops thing. Again, people are like, Docker means we don't need operations anymore. And and again, we're all still here. <laughs> and, and yesterday, you know, we had some some talks about uh, immutable infrastructure and and you know. Uh, Configuration management, you know, Docker, some stuff's going to go in Docker, some stuff's going to stay on you know, traditional machines, some stuff's going to be serverless. You're going to have all this stuff. But, uh, but uh, you know, the Docker really kind of changed how we talked about things, and it allowed people to keep moving faster, which reinforced the ideas of continuous delivery, continuous integration, test-driven infrastructure. It just, you know, keeps, keeps happening. Uh, James was busy that year. Uh, he came out with a book called The Art of Monitoring uh, in December that year. And you know, around 2011, 2012, uh, there was a movement uh, in DevOps uh, that started being as a thing called monitoring sucks. It was a hashtag about how crappy monitoring was, right? We, we'd, you know, Nagios is still around, so obviously it's uh, not everything's changed, but you know, people were dissatisfied with the state of monitoring. You know, the, the infrastructure was finally moving fast. You know, we, were, we had cloud infrastructure that was coming and going. It was starting to look ephemeral, a little, you know, a little more immutable. Uh, and monitoring was having a hard time keeping up. Um, and so what this book did was, was it, it talked about why you monitor and what you should be looking for. It's not just about filling up as many dashboards as you possibly can. You want to start looking for the things that actually bring value to you as an operations team and your business going forward. And so. Um, a lot of really good lessons in the book. He ties it into to Riemann uh, a bit, which is not the most popular monitoring framework, but you know, it, it, the book is still very relevant. And, and as you start to look at things like observability today with you know, the third, fourth, fifth generation monitoring tools, you know, the concepts in the book are still really valid. And, and so this book, when you talk to people like uh, you know, the, the Honeycomb folks and, and, and uh, you know, the other new monitoring tools, They'll point back to this book and say, you know, this actually brought crystallized a lot of ideas around uh, the space at the time. And and so today, w you know, when we start talking about monitoring, people they're getting the idea of obser uh, observability that you know monitoring is a means to an end. It's not just gathering metrics. It's gathering metrics enough so you can understand the state of your system at any given time, and you know how you, something happened. Um, and so that's you know good book. Uh, and all of his books are good. 2014 was the first year uh, that the State of DevOps report came out, and so this was uh, uh, this was put together by Dr. Nicole Forsgren, who uh, 
uh, she's you know, got an academic and uh, IT background, and uh, she's the CEO and chief scientist at the DevOps uh, Research and Assessment Organization. Uh, they put out, they try to take a scientific approach to measuring how companies and businesses uh, deliver IT and you know, the, the, the businesses that run on top of it. And through this survey that uh, you know, they continue to put it out year after year, um, they've identified you know, the differences between high-performing IT organizations uh, and their competition and you know, who's profitable, you know, how that relates to market share, and they're really tied, tied closely. Um, the companies that you know, are, are you know, the, the, the winners at IT happen to frequently be the winners at, at business as well. And so um, one of the things they, they try to point out is you know, these things are you know, tightly coupled that you know, uh, continuous delivery, lean management techniques um, produce better results, employees are happier, happy employees have better culture, better culture leads way to uh, you know, just better business results. It's just this virtuous cycle. And so every year they keep having to kind of change the goalpost between the high performing and the low performing because the high performing people are pulling away, right? They're actually getting better and better because they're on this continuous improvement loop that, that uh, just gets better. And each year the, the report kind of takes on a, a little more prescriptive recommendations for how you should do things. And so uh, the 2018 report came out uh, uh, a few months ago. And it was really notable what they called out was outsourcing. They said, you know, high-performing organizations do not outsource, right? If you want to move fast, it has to be you and your company, you know, moving fast together. It's, it, asking someone else to deliver things for you is just adding slowness to the system. Um, and so that, that was interesting. They also started talking more about, you know, culture and burnout uh, and, you know, things to avoid. But, you know, every year comes out really great uh, report. Uh, and, and, and Dora's doing uh, really good work. All right, April 2016. Who's read the, the Site Reliability Engineering book? Right? This is, Google put this out for free. Uh, you can still go download it uh, from their website. You can buy it if you want, but uh, it is free. Um, and it, it, it's a good book. Uh, it's similar to the Web Operations book where it's a kind of a collection of essays about how Google's SRE team does various aspects, you know, how they do provisioning, monitoring, um, you know, that, that sort of stuff. And, um, but, but it is also like a, an employee handbook for Google. <laughs> so if you read it and you think, you know, we should be just like that, you need to remember that this is Google, right? So they're a, a different organization. They're, you know, tens of thousands of people uh, and they have a lot of uh, specialized folks. Um, and, but core to the way they operate is product teams own operations for their applications. And this is something that is kind of key to DevOps, is just, you know, you can't have developers write some code, throw it over the wall, and let operations deal with it. You know, you have to own the entire life cycle. And so if, if development feels the pain of operations, they're going to do a better job and ideally, you know, make the application more resilient. Um, and at Google, they have an SRE team, a site reliability engineering team. Their job is to provide a platform of tools uh, and, and techniques for everyone at Google to be on the same page. And when your team is having trouble, uh, you can, it's almost like a chargeback model where you can bring in additional assistance from the SRE team. You don't get SRE for free at Google. Um, and, and so what, you know, it, it's very specific to them. And then once they've kind of, you know, righted the ship and taught you how to, to fish for yourself, you know, they want to detach from your organization. And so, you know, it's, it's not, the same model uh, that everyone else you know, uh, uses. Um, it is uh, the idea of having you know, this platform engineering team. It, it's, it's still a very popular uh, idea, but it might not work for you. So you know, do not grab this and say, like, we're going to be SREs now. Because obviously, just as we've seen you know, uh, DevOps engineering, uh, you know, people who they used to call them you know, sysadmins, now they just slap DevOps engineer on the front, and it's the same job. Now they're doing that with SRE. Right now, there are you know organizations that last week they were IT operations and this week they're you know site little site reliability engineering, without changing anything. You know this is a, a very different model, but it's it's got a lot of really uh, interesting concepts in it. Definitely take the time to read it. Um, but you know kind of key to this also is 
you don't want to have this tiger team who's responsible for, for doing DevOps where everyone else tries to go off and do things the way they've been doing them historically, right? We don't want to have this center of excellence because what that means is, you know, the center of excellence means if you're not inside the center, you're in the outside of suck, right? Um, <laughs> you, 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 you don't want, uh, you want to break down that and have a community of practice. And so, uh, you know, it's a good book. Uh, check it out. And it's free. Um, June 2016, uh, Jennifer Davis and, and Ren Daniels uh, put out a book uh, for O'Reilly called Effective DevOps. And this book is very different from uh, uh, a lot of the other ones out there. This one is very focused on culture. Um, and, and, and culture is, is very important to how you deliver IT uh, operations because you're trying to change how your organization has traditionally worked. And so the, the book is, is a, lot of, uh, a lot of talk about imp improving collaboration, um, why high-performing organizations have a culture of you know, honest feedback and collaboration and blameless postmortems. It all comes back to empathy. You know, having understanding of how people run your software are going to deal with it, trying to write good software for them, trying to you know, work well and, and, uh, with your coworkers. Um, it's a very uh, culture book, um, which is interesting uh, because almost uh, around the same time, the DevOps Handbook came out. And, and the books are almost like a, a yin and yang uh, to each other because the DevOps Handbook is, is literally like a cookbook for how to do the manual steps of DevOps, right? It's very prescriptive about you know, lean operations, about fast feedback loops, setting up CI, CD pipelines, having demo days, and you know, all the nuts and bolts of, of what it looks like to be a high-performing organization, but it doesn't lean, talk about the culture that much. It's, it's just like, you know, well, you're going to have a team that do this and you'll have two week sprints and you'll talk to each other. They're, very, they're both very good books, and they're, but they're, they're companion pieces. I, I was talking to John Willis, one of the authors of it, about it. He said when he heard that the O'Reilly book was coming out right before them, he got very nervous because he was like, you know, two DevOps books coming out at the same time. You know, they're going to cannibalize each other's market share. But, you know, they, uh, he actually wrote the foreword for the other book because once he read it, he's like, these books are totally different, right? Um, and, and so, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're coming from the Phoenix uh, project and you want the how-to, uh, grab this book because uh, uh, it, it's really good. Kubernetes is up and running. So this was the first Kubernetes book. Um, you know, the, uh, as, as, as our industry continues to evolve, you know, obviously we've learned a lot of lessons from open source. Um, and Google had learned a lot of lessons from how people were consuming their white papers, right? Google would put out these white papers about how we do you know, uh, databases at large scale or how we do you know, uh, load balancing at, at scale. And the, you know, someone in the industry or someone who used to work at Google would be like, I got a startup, I'm gonna go do that thing that Google just described. Um, and so what you end up with is you know, tools like uh, uh, Cassandra and, 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 and Hadoop and all these, well, some of them aren't, aren't from Google, but you know, the idea is where it happened to some big company and then someone else went out and did an open source project based on the ideas there, right? MapReduce, uh, I think, came out of Google. Um, and so the SRE book was them trying to tell people, well, this is how we do operations. You could too. And then Kubernetes up and running, you know, Google open sourced uh, Kubernetes. It wasn't done when they released it. What they were releasing was like, this is a, a this is what if you were running, if you were writing, you know, the third generation of our uh, infrastructure tool, it would look kind of like this. Uh, here's a starter kit. You know, Kubernetes did not like, you know, pro pop out fully baked. It was uh, uh, kind of half baked or quarter baked. Um, and, and but they wanted to get the industry to adopt the patterns they used. And so they put out Kubernetes uh, as an open source project. It, it obviously uh, it took off pretty well. Uh, you know, here we are today, um, and it's pretty much eaten everything around it. Uh, you know, there's uh, you know, plenty of people who have decided to standardize on it. Um, it does seem to be the way going forward. It's got you know, contributors from, from all corners of the industry. Uh, and, and it's done quite well. And obviously this continues to change how we think about uh, operations in IT and, and, and development. Um, getting used to the idea of uh, you know, containerization, orchestration, immutable infrastructure, monitoring at scale, networking at scale, you know, this kind of ties it all together. And uh, 
The book's pretty good. Uh, there's a new a new one that came out yesterday uh, that I haven't read yet, but I, I you know, downloaded the free ebook from Heptio this morning. Um, uh, Kubernetes operations. So you know, check that one out too if you're uh, into the Kubernetes. Uh, lots of lots of free books. Um, yeah. So the last book uh, I was going to talk about today um, uh, was Accelerate. So you know, we talked about the state of DevOps reports every year. Dora puts these out. And uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, you know, she's the, the lead author of, of Accelerate, but it's also, uh, she's, she's assisted by, by Jazz and Jean. Uh, you know, Jazz from our continuous delivery book and uh, Jean from the Phoenix Project. You know, you know they, uh, they've, uh, they've, they've put out Accelerate and Accelerate dives deeper into the state of DevOps reports. It talks about, uh, you know, it talks about the same concepts, obviously. Uh, State of DevOps report is, is only like, you know, 20 pages long, and so this is, you know, 200 pages on, you know, how we can apply technology to drive business value. And what they've learned uh, from, from uh, the, the surveys they've done, um, how organizations should be formed uh, to deliver uh, IT to solve business problems. Uh, they talk a lot about the Westrom model. So I, you know, I'm sure that's probably come up uh, in conversations about how organizations need to become uh, culturally uh, performance oriented. We call it generative organizations, ones that accept feedback and they become learning organizations versus, you know, the, the bureaucratic organizations where everything's based off rules or, uh, you know, the, the power oriented, which they call the, the pathological organization. They, they spend a fair amount of time in, in Accelerate talking about that stuff, but really, you want to, the, the book is, is very uh, prescriptive and just says, look, you know, you don't have to do it, but the people who do it this way, they're the ones who win. And, and so, uh, we, you know, we just want to continue to take those lessons and, and become high-performing organizations. Right. So what's the future, right? I mean, a lot of stuff has happened in the last 10 years. Uh, you know, DevOps days, everyone I go to, uh, there's new content, uh, new things uh, coming along. Um, you know, really the key is you have to keep learning. Uh, because as we've seen, you know, whether it's, you know, Docker, Kubernetes, or, you know, monitoring, or, you know, what have you, everything keeps changing. And, uh, you know, you, you can't uh, stop what you're doing, but empathy and culture are going to trump everything. You know, organizations have to become uh, learning organizations that are going to learn together so they can deliver, operation, uh, deliver business value through operations uh, faster. Um, you know, and as I'm sure AI will have some effect, uh, you know, some uh, serverless stuff is obviously going to change it, but, you know, this time next year, things will be the same but different. So, <laughs> uh, there are no silver bullets. So, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Matt, for a great keynote. Uh, yeah, it's my second time attending the keynote from Jakarta. And we're very uh, proud that you have uh, evolved the talk <laughs> in Singapore and yes. uh, added Accelerate. I feel that Amazon really likes all the referrals that you sent them, <laughs> <laughs> follow the books. Uh, so I've asked one question and it has been voted. So what will happen in next 10 years? Your top three predictions. Whew. Yeah. Top three predictions. All right. Number one. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, so, uh, who knows Simon Wardley? Uh, he, he does the uh, uh, Wardley maps are about you know, mapping uh, your organization, deciding what provides business value, what is commoditized, what you should focus on, what you should let other people do. Um, and one of the things that he's been harping on uh, always uh, is serverless, right? Um, that uh, he, he said, you know, I'm, I'm willing to bet you know, a, a fine cup of tea uh, that in the next five years, half of IT will be delivered through serverless. Um, I'm willing to take that bet. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, but I do think uh, serverless is going to definitely have a very strong impact on how people move faster, right? And so um, adopting that is, is definitely going to uh, continue to you know, distance you from the slower parts of IT. You know, uh, some things are going to continue to be slow, some things are going to move faster, um, and serverless is about as fast as you can go uh, at this point. Um, you know, it has its downsides, of course. Uh, you know, monitoring, observability, that, that's obviously an issue, um, and it can get expensive, but uh, you know, I think that's 
that's kind of key to the future. I think, um, I, I, I believe there's going to be a lot more security focus. Um, you know, GDPR has uh, obviously uh, uncapped a lot of attention on, on the state of compliance and, and security. Uh, you know, security and, and monitoring kind of have a perpetual renaissance. There's always new companies coming on the scene because there's always new problems or new techniques to solve those things. Um, you know, I'm quite excited by a, a lot of the, the new approaches to security. Um, but, you know, a lot of security still is, hey, people aren't doing the obvious things, <laughs> like patching and, and, and the sorts. So uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. I think that's probably a safe bet. Um, and, you know, I, I think let's say my, my, my third prediction uh, is not uh, particularly... Uh, uh, incendiary. I, th I think we're probably seeing a, a consolidation of everything in the cloud, probably four cloud vendors. You know, uh, I don't know who number four is. <laughs> but I, I think probably four cloud vendors will probably own about 90% of the IT in about five years, or 10 years. I got 10 years for them to have 90% of hosting everything. So yeah, uh, that's a safe bet. Right. Okay, thank you for answering the question. Our second is, is configuration management becoming irrelevant as immutable infrastructure is becoming more and more practical? Uh, we had a whole uh, session on this yesterday. Um, yes and no, right? Um, it depends on how you define configuration management. Uh, one of the things we were talking about yesterday was uh, baking AMIs, you know, making golden images that, you know, you have a pipeline that once a week, you know, maybe every couple days, you put out a new base image for your uh, application, and it requires just, you know, just a little bit of configuration once it's out the door. Well, there's still configuration management there. I mean, how do you build that image? Once it's deployed, how do you connect it to LDAP? How do you assign it to its monitoring stuff? There's still some of that. Um, I think the, the, the uh, immutable infrastructure approach uh, that's, that's the goal, really. You want to have as few moving pieces, and you want to have as much um, loosely coupled systems as you can. You, know, you want to have small, discrete things that are easy to understand, easy to measure, easy to monitor. That's what Docker is, right? Um, and, and moving them into a system like a Kubernetes or Mesosphere that can understand how these things work together and allow you to have you know, higher level abstractions over them, that's great, right? Unfortunately, there's still a lot of stuff that is, you know, not even automated uh, that's sitting in, in data centers or uh, large applications that are hard to containerize. Um, so you're going to have a blend of, of infrastructure and operations. It's just, you know, not everything can be serverless, not everything can go in Docker, and, you know, definitely not everything belongs on, you know, bare metal and, and VMs, you know, so uh, it's not going away. Uh, thank you, man. And if we can have one more round of applause for our second question.